Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests. Welcome to this special congregation, Power of Her Voice with Dr. Kiran Bedi, where we are celebrating Women's Day in our own humble way. Connected across Wiles Toastmasters Club has organized a rendezvous with an icon who is a living testimony to the spirit of womanhood. We welcome you all again. My name is Shobit Singhal, your Sergeant at Arms for today. And with me, I have another experienced Toastmaster, our tech master for the day, Toastmaster Vivek Dora. Welcome, Vivek. Thank you, Toastmaster Shobit. Good evening, everybody. I can feel the energy already. Can you, Shobit? Indeed, indeed. The energy is there and the whole room is being illuminated by the rays of so many luminaries here. But now let's think about it. If you translate the word ray into Hindi, it translates to Kiran. Yeah. Yeah. And what comes to your mind, Vivek, when you hear the name Kiran? For me, the word Kiran means hope. A ray of hope for so many women. Yes. Kiran, who dared to aspire higher. Yeah, well, Kiran also means shine bright. With so many achievements. Indeed. Kiran, who is now a guiding light to so many dreams and ambitions. Well, this can go on and on, but we need to move ahead with the event as well. But before we start, it is my responsibility here to share with all of you the vision, mission, and belief that drives us all here at Connected Across Miles Toastmasters Club. So our vision at Connected Across Toastmasters Club is to connect with Toastmasters worldwide for global networking and collaboration. Our mission, to embrace diversity, learn about various cultures and foster excellence as global citizens, thereby providing a supportive and positive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. And our belief, we believe that our initiative should encourage all to expand their horizons and achieve excellence beyond boundaries. Over Thank to you, you, Vivek. Thank you, Shobit. Uh, to ensure excellence, here are a few ground rules for the meeting. At the Toastmasters meeting, you are prohibited, you're not prohibited, but advised to speak responsibly on sex, religion, and politics. You are requested to keep your noise making devices on mute to avoid any disturbance during the meeting. Request you to remain on mute when a speaker is speaking to avoid any disturbance. You shall be called on the stage and allowed to speak only at the discussion of the facilitator of the meeting. This meeting will be recorded by the training purpose and reference in future. By being part of this meeting, you give your agreement to be recorded and approve the circulation of this recording over media for spreading the positive message that we intend to deliver to the public at large. So let's introduce MC of the day. She is none other than the healthcare administrator, Toastmaster Jayati Datta. The stage is yours, Toastmaster Jayati. Thank you. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters and distinguished guests. A round of applause for our Sergeant at Arms, Division F Director, Toastmaster Shobit Singhal, a market researcher by profession, and our Tech Master, Division A Director, Toastmaster Vivek Diora, an entrepreneur. Welcome to Connected Across Miles Toastmasters Club on the Eve of Women's Day. I have always been a confident person, but there was a time in my life during my college days when my confidence was shaking. It was then that my mother showed me a few articles of this amazing woman who was achieving milestones after milestones. She was going out of her comfort zone to achieve many milestones and that inspired me to take that deep of confidence. This lady has been inspiring generations of Indian youngsters to achieve excellence out of their comfort zone. Yes, this is Dr. Kiran Bedi. I would now like to invite Associate Club Growth Director Toastmaster Asankya Vishwamohan, a senior associate at EduTech firm for the welcome address. 
Toastmaster Master Asankhya. A round of applause for our Masters of Ceremony, Yadan and our Sajid Rams, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters. Good afternoon, good morning, for wherever you are joining from across the world. I welcome you once again to an evening with none other than Dr. Kiran Bedi. I will be, again, this is something that we all have been looking up to for the past week or so, preparing, planning for this. With regards to my experience, getting to know and having this session being part, part of the session specifically on this occasion of International Women's Day, I would like to recollect and go back, reminisce a bit uh, to my childhood days when my first encounter happened with none other than my mother, later my grandmother, who were the guiding force in my initial days, my nascent days, my teenage days, who helped me navigate through the world. And if I recollect the first incidents that they might have mentioned about uh, me introduce, they introducing me to Dr. Kiran Bedi was how someone who is an IPS officer, who is who has the courage to tow the car of the then serving Prime Minister Dr. Narayan Shri Indira Gandhi. So that is my first encounter, getting to know the experiences, the impacts she has made in her lifetime, in her journey as a civil servant, as a government official. And we are all here to witness her. If you have just joined, hold on. You haven't missed anything yet. We are just getting started and you, we will be just having her on the stage as well. Without further ado, I would now like to hand the stage back to our Masters of Ceremony. And I welcome you all once again to the evening with Dr. Kiran Bedi. Over to you, Dr. Toastmaster Jayati Dutta. Thank you, Toastmaster Asankhya. Throughout history, female poets have used their voices to be catalysts for social and political change. And their words are just as important today as they have ever been. Let's hear from HR professional Toastmaster Brunda Shashikumar. Mm -hmm. Toastmaster Brunda. Good evening, everyone. Here's a poem. It's called, I Don't Fit in Their Idea of a Woman by Gayatri Deshmukh. They tell me how I should behave, show some tolerance and fear the knave. They call me a loose cannon because I don't fit in their idea of a woman. They talk of ethics and morals. I say they are mere mortals. They want to put me in a prison because I don't fit in their idea of a woman. They call me vile names, but their reputation is in flames. They fear my nuanced precision because I don't fit in their idea of a woman. They talk of womanhood and equality, only exposing their frivolity. Rationality is not in their disposition because I don't fit in their idea of a woman. Their petty minds make me furious, but their actions also make me curious. How they make a crime out of my ambition because I don't fit in their idea of a woman. I care not for their ego. I fear not their despot. I live in my life on my terms and conditions because I don't want to fit in their idea of a woman. Thank you. Thank you, Toastmaster Vrinda. It is now time to begin the session for which we all have gathered. It is time to experience the power of her voice. Time to hear the Iron Lady of India herself. Kiran Bedi was born on 9th June 1949 in Amritsar. The second of four daughters, her education included an undergraduate degree in English, 
a master's degree in political science, a law degree, and a PhD in social science, with a focus on drug abuse and domestic violence. She is the first woman who joined the Indian Police Service, the IPS, in 1972 and went on to serve a variety of roles, including narcotics officer, anti-terrorist specialist, and administrator. She was instrumental in introducing prison reforms in India. She has earned recognition for the work as she did as Inspector General of Prisons beginning in 1994. In that capacity, she reshaped one of the largest prisons in the world, the Tihar Prison Complex in Delhi. In 2003, she became the first woman and the first Indian to be appointed United Nations Civilian Police Advisor. She is the recipient of numerous awards, in India and abroad. Cadet Officer Award in 1968, President's Police Award in 1979, Asia Region Award in 1991, Ramon Magsese Award in 1994, F.R. Mashio Humanitarian Award in 1995, Pride of India in 1999, Morrison Tom Glitchoff Award in 2001, United Nations Medal in 2004, Mother Teresa Memorial National Award for Social Justice in 2005, Kumarappa Reckless Award in 2008. From 2016 to 2021, she served as the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry Union Territory, leaving an indelible mark on Indian governance and social reform. In addition to all of this, she is an avid tennis player. She is celebrated both in India and internationally, recognizing her exceptional contribution to society. Now, we begin the question and answer session, which will be moderated by stress and anxiety management coach, Toastmaster Gayatri Deshbek. Toastmaster Gayatri. Thank you so much, Madam Dr. Kiran Bedi, for gracing us with your presence. You have inspired not just one, two, three generations, but if we count every decade as a generation, then you have effectively inspired five generations so far. Whenever I was scared, my mother used to tell me, be like my hero, because her hero was Dr. Kiran Bedi. My mother never managed to become IPS officer, though she still says, if I was not married and I had an opportunity, I would have become like Kiran Bedi. And that is what the name Kiran Bedi means for all of us. When I was reading about you for all these years, there was this one particular thing I read. You said this, and that kind of stuck with me. You said empowered women who reach tough or unconventional positions make choices, not sacrifice. It is an inspiring quote. But today, if we talk about reality, the class ceiling still exists. Women are still forced to feel guilty for their choices. Sacrifices are still glorified. Do you think our society is ready to really accept women who make choices, not sacrifices? That's a question? Yes, ma'am. Let me begin by saying thank you to all of you first. Thank you for this invitation and thank you for sparing your very valuable time. I have great respect for Toastmasters. This is not my first interaction with you. 
over the years in my service, I have been interacting once in a while and I know how valuable this invitation is. So thank, thank each one of you and particularly certainly guy through you that you connected with me and invited me for this event. I hope we wouldn't prolong this and you could have a dinner uh, early on. Uh, uh, unless you had a dinner, early dinner, or you'll have a late dinner today. But thank you so much once again and on the eve of the Women's Day that you uh, uh, set this up. Your question is, is the society um, ready? Ready for women, uh, unconventional women, am I right? Yes, ma'am. Exceptions, yes, but not as a whole. My short, straight answer is exceptions, yes, but not as a whole, yet. I think we will take another, another 20 years. At least another 20 years. You see, you and I are a very small minority. We are a very small minority. Seeing, looking at about half, half the billion population of more, let's say half a billion population. In this half, how many are at the top of the government and how many at the top of the, uh, the corporate world? But let me, and that I call them the haves. You're the, we are the haves. We are far too many have-nots. And we are lot many millions of having stage. Now the having stage and the have-not stage still is very, very heavily uh, uh, male-dominated. And they're controlling the women for the reason that they're not financially empowered. They're not financially empowered. They're not psychologically independent. They're mentally also dependent. They may have a skill. They may have a skill to earn for themselves, but that doesn't give them the freedom of choices. They still may not be able to decide whether they want to be a mother. And how many times? How many times? And they may still not be having control over their own finances. So let me come to the small category of haves, which we are here before. This is a minority which doesn't define the situation. It is an example. I think most of us are still exceptions to the rule. Rule still is domination. Exception is freedom, which we have all earned for some ourselves. And that when we collectively work, maybe a very large number compared to small countries in Europe. But when it comes to proportion of Indian population, it was, it's not large enough. It's not impressive enough yet. But what is visibly visible through the media is the have thinking it's a very big revolution. I'll give you now example of what I'm saying. Yeah. Two days ago, I was in a particular city and I got to meet a, a senior police officer, IPS officer, and she happened to be a woman. And I got chatting with her, asking her and a few others in, about uh, who were around her. And I said, tell me your run of postings. Most of our postings were not in the field. And many other officers who were in that state also were not in the field. They were around positions which were away from the field. Whereas many of the men are spending very vital time of their career in the field, grappling with crime and law and order, connecting with the people, asserting their leadership, being visible, making a name for themselves, making a career. But many of these women were on the sidelines. Then I started to ask her about the, about the others, about the junior ranks, because we are all striving towards raising the percentage of police in the, in the, in the, in the country. And I said, what about them? She says, ma'am, they are in an unhappy situation. I said, why? He says, ma because ma'am, it's in a double work for them. It's a double whammy. They want the job. They want the job, but it's a double whammy because this is a, a, not a time structured job. And then they go back home, they go back cook. And if they're mothers, they have a very little support of their parents or the mothers-in-law. 
So, and they don't have days, daycare centers to take care of them, family. So I said, then why are they keeping the job? They said, because they have nothing else to do. Their job, which they earn. So imagine the kind of life. So we say, oh, a sub-inspector police officer or police officer in uniform. She's a woman. I We do not know what's happening behind. The men are still not accepting. Then I asked her, what about food? She says, the, the husbands of these women still say, Mujhe to khana, aap se khana hai. Tere haat ka khana hai. Utka nahi khana. So they do not want the food coming from the person who's paid staff, maybe. She still has to go back and cook. And many of them do not have control over the uh, full salaries fully. It may either be going into a joint account or she's accounted for. She's accounting for. So I think we still do not know the reality. And uh, the worst part is, and she said, ma'am, I said, what about the infrastructure in the in the police station? She said, the police stations still do not have a, have toilets. And they don't drink enough water because where else will they go? And because of lack of hydration, uh, a lack of proper hydration, some of them suffer, start suffering early for many urinary tract uh, infections. So I'm not in a, a situation after this kind of, and it's a, a, a tier one city. I was speaking to staff in the tier one city, not tier two and three. So if that is the situation there, and it's a, it's a progressive city. That was an indicator of what's happening in the state police forces. So if this is happening to the police forces, what happens to the others? So I did raise this in Niti Aayog meeting yesterday. There was a Women's Day function by Niti Aayog. And I said, well, whatever we wish to say, say, but I want to tell you what's happening. We've done Swachh Bharat for uh, people at large. But we've not done Swachh Bharat for women in police uniforms. So I said, and number two, they don't speak up. Third, the media doesn't write about them. Fourth, they are they have no grievance redressal systems. Who do they write to? And if they write to, they break hierarchies. So you see, there are many hidden, many hidden. Uh, I also run a foundation where we work with women which only 40 kilometers away from my home, where I'm sitting. It's only 30 kilometers away from the international airport. And we are still doing women empowerment there. We are still skilling women. We are still, still making them mobile. So I think we are still many years behind. So when you and I are here, we are a very minority uh, percentage, though very visible, very articulate, very wealthy now and very intelligent and spread all over the world and making a great name for India because we are already, this is also a big number. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned that you are a product of visionary mother and father. I think yeah. I was also blessed with a visionary mother and father, which is how I believe I am a part of that minority, thankfully. Ma'am, you spoke about the current scenario of the of the position of women in police services even today. You became the first female IPS officer 52 years ago. Last year, the proportion of women graduated from IPS was recorded at 23%. We have a question about your observation a little more elaborately on this. To ask this question, I would like to invite on virtual podium Toastmaster Sharmishtha Ghosh, a senior technical consultant from a multi multinational company. Sharmishtha. Thank you, Toastmaster Gayatri. And very good evening to all my Toastmaster friends and particularly to Madam Dr. Kiran Bin. I'm really honored to sharing to be sharing the podium with you. Ma'am, you mentioned that the situation might not have changed much uh, because there are many have, still there are so many have not. But considering that you have joined the police forces 52 years, uh, first IPS officer 52 years back, do you see a shift in trend in women voluntarily joining the IPS and they are getting more support from their family members, especially the married women? That is where the change is substantial. You have very many bright girls taking the UPSC examination and wanting to be in the IPS. They are the NCC cadets 
they are the sports girls, they're the brighter ones, they were extracurricular all rounders. So that's a very large percentage. But they, you can still pick, count them in hundreds. The change is in millions. Change is not by hundreds. But yes, they're the trend, trendsetters and the leaders. And many of them have retired as director generals of police. And they have also become director generals of the central police, central forces, which is very good, very impressive. Just as few of the uh, officers in the armed forces are now women, commissioned officers are men, but they don't make the army. So it's, it's a lot of optics there, but it's still very good, very substantial. I am looking at India as a whole. I'm not looking as a, a small percentage. So th things have changed hugely, but they are on the forward march. They are on a forward march and accelerating undoubtedly. I'm more interested, interested in also what comes along as an ecosystem. And that ecosystem was for the junior ranks. For the seniors, uh, they are the leaders. They are actually responsible to work on the ecosystem for the, for the rank and file. But are they in a position to do that? All of them? Maybe or maybe not. That's a leadership challenge now. But uh, IPS has dramatically changed. You have them in the CRPF, the BSF, the ITBP, um, the uh, uh, border security forces everywhere. But they are one or two leaders, one or two, one or two, one or two. You also have a battalion. You also have a battalion. We also have police. Uh, you see, if you see, I'm talking to you one side and I'm also tech talking to you where they, it's, we've not succeeded. We've succeeded. We are also spending, sending peacekeeping forces to the United Nations, women's, but we're sending platoons, not battalions. And platoon is comprising of only 30 women. But symbolically, we are succeeding in sending women to the United Nations peacekeeping operations, which is Liberia and elsewhere. And our women are being valued very well because they're so well-trained, they're so passionate and missionary, and they're very disciplined, and they also have their heart in the right place. So we've come a long way, but a long way to go, but a great many beginnings have been made. That should make India proud, and that is what is shown and seen by the world over. Thank you so much, Sharmishtha. Thank you. Ma'am, there is this one particular phenomena which has been around for ages. Today, because even though we call ourselves minority, women have come out of the dominion to a large extent. You had said that when you were a child, it was boys' world. Boys would inherit everything, boys would run the businesses, and girls would dolled up and get them married. Today, things may have changed, but the perception of men has not really changed as much. Phenomena is like when we are still being patronized every now and then. They don't even realize that they are being patronizing towards us. Then there is, again, phenomena called mansplaining. It doesn't matter how much we explain that you're mansplaining, they don't understand the logic behind the whole concept. It can get irritating. What is your advice to those women, women like me, who face these things in and out, day in and day out in various scenarios like social work, in the social environment, workplace, or even family space? How do we deal with it without losing our minds? So briefly, what's your, so that I get the essence of your question? The mansplaining part, it can really get under our skin. And it does. The patronizing that happens from men, it kind of bothers. How to deal with these situations without losing our mind, without getting irritated, without really... Who's patronizing? You mean the society patronizing men? Yes. The men patronizing women or the mansplaining thing, wherein we know stuff, but men still tend to explain us things. I've still not understood your question. Uh, Ma'am, it is more like the domination that we have from men. That particular part. It's still... Domination by men or yes, of men? Domination of men. And they don't realize that it is domination. Mm. And that can get under the skin. It can play with our state of mind. Mm. What is your advice to deal with this scenario without losing mm. our mind? Okay. So you are saying the how does how do we respond to uh, a persistent domination by men? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
by our own confidence, by our own prep, our own determination. You cannot tell them not to dominate you because that's their nature. That's their being trained. That's their being their grooming. First of all, also all men are not alike. Just as all women were not alike, all men are not alike, and men are also changing. But again, that's a, a that's part that's a minuscule. So men are also changing, but those who are not changing are the ones who are dominating. They they are exercising the patriarchy. If I I get your question right, yes, ma'am. Why? Because their bring upbringing is patriarchal. They habituated to patriarchal. They've seen that in their homes as patriarchal. Uh, their uh, education has also been lopsided on promoting patriarchal. So they are what they are. We are all products of our upbringing. As are the boys, as are the men. And who is responsible for it? Is the, their parents themselves. The parents of these boys. When a girl is being held back, it's the parents. When the boy is being made patriarchal oriented, it's a it's a parents. When the boy, the parents, it's a parents who groom. Just as you and I are product of our parents, our pa so are they. So therefore, they you can't change them. You have to deal with them by your skill, by your confidence, and not give up. You have to outperform them sometimes. And if it's a corporate world, they. No training will do. It's I think a lot of uh, sensitization will have to happen. It's not easy. I've dealt with very, very patriarchal police officers. They did not change. I only had to deal with them. They were obstructing me at various places. They denied me sometimes my promotions. They tried to harass me. But I went on regardless of their attitude, knowing who they are. It was very, it was not, I don't think we could change them. I couldn't. They wouldn't. So therefore, they resisted as much as they could. And I also persisted not to change them, but to establish my own confidence in my own worth. So it was a quite a big struggle. No, I... It is a struggle. At the moment, it's still a struggle. Same thing, patriarchal husband, family member in the house. If you have a very patriarchal dominating husband, you had it. That's where the fault lies in. Uh, what happened in the marriage stage? What did you uh, see before? But then sometimes it's not visible. What do you do later? Now, how do you adjust or how do you change a man? How, how, when does he change a man? I think these are the difficulties of relationships, either at work or in families. But remember, there are men and men. They're dominating men and they're also reasonable men who have respect for uh, their spouses for who they are. So it, it, it's work relationship. It's a lot of female training to deal. That's why you're networking. Female networking is important. Female sisterhood is important. Where they get together to make each other learn and understand. Your mentoring, your mentors you find is important to deal with the situation. So it's a very, so I'm only theoretically answering, but I'm only telling you what I've experienced. You can't change them. You can only deal with them. I'm going to take that, ma'am, because I'll be honest, I've tried changing. It does not work. It did not work with my grandfather. It did not work with my father or any other men around me. So I'm going to start dealing with them and not try to change because it takes a toll on our minds rather than anything else. You have to understand them, where they're coming from, and then, but not give up and, and not change your own course. You carry on. They will one day realize. You know, Indira Nui was, was talking about her in her book. Her mother, her mother, actually, her, she had very liberal father and grandfather, but she had a mother. She said, you girls want to go overseas and uh, do a study further? First get married and then mother she's written in her book and uh, uh, and the mother was saying i don't care and if you do this if you go overseas etc for a scholarship without getting married i'm sitting on a fast unto death so do you know what happened the her father indra's father and the grandfather saying don't worry let her sit on this she'll be okay after a few days so they let her fast 
and there now the ship broke the fast. <laughs> and Indra knew it. So what did they do? They dealt with her. They dealt. Now it's not just a man, it's sometimes a woman also. Yes, the products of patriarchal system can not always be men, sometimes women as well. Yeah. Ma'am, you have inspired and served as an example for not just women in India, but even women across seas. Like the simple advice that you just gave, don't try to change, just deal with them. For some advices like that only, we have a friend joining us all the way from Malaysia, Toastmaster Eliza Yulianor Roche. She works in an aerospace company and a global Toastmaster. Eliza. Thank you very much. Very good evening, ma'am. So I'm coming all the way from Malaysia and I read one of your book, It Is Possible. Oh. And oh. when I read your book, I just say like, oh, wow, this woman really trying to put herself into a danger. <laughs> yeah, so my, uh, when I know that you are trying to change the things in Tihar prison, is something that not an ordinary woman could do because it's a very, very hard. And actually for a person like you, maybe you can try to find an easy way as a woman. And especially when, uh, from my Bollywood movies and everything where all the women is just doll up to get married and not to fight for the, and working with all the rapists, all the terrorists or something like that in the prison. So my question for you is, what is motivates you to take this highly challenging roles and very dangerous position? And also how to navigate the challenge in your leadership journey, especially in controlling the man that maybe the one to be led by the woman. Thank Give you, ma'am. Name again, Eliza, right? <laughs> yes. Eliza, are you uh, are you uh, aware of an institution called ICLIP in Kuala Lumpur? No, I didn't. It's a very interesting, you have a very interesting... The leadership training program uh, from Eclipse Institution. And I've been to Kuala Lumpur to doing these programs and speaking engagements in Eclipse. It's a very interesting, uh, in interesting program. And I thought maybe you, because this book you mentioned about mine that was, was used by Eclipse in Kuala Lumpur Institution. So anyway, I thought maybe you were uh, linked with it in somehow or the other. But now uh, answering your question, look, we are all, uh, we all have our attitudes to work when we go to work. Since you talked about my prison assignment as well. Elisa, if I get your question right. So what's your crux of the question you would want me to answer? Because you, it was a long question and I don't want to lose the answer you want. What motivates you to take a challenging role? Okay. Yeah. What motivates me is my attitude to work. Now, let me explain to you what is my attitude to work, which can be belonging to man or a woman, but that's been my attitude. That's why I succeeded enormously in many, many things I did. And that's called cultivating a mindset of constructive discontent. When I enter a profession or I assignment, there is an element of constructive discontent. And that is the key. This involves being satisfied with achievements, but always looking for ways to do better. And because I have this attitude of cult constructive discontent, status quo change. And what happens? Workplace cultures change because I have a constructive discontent. I don't settle down with what is existing. I start examining what is existing and I start looking at what can I do to make things better. So therefore, that constructive discontent, it's not destructive, it's constructive discontent. I'm not satisfied with what I've inherited. And if it is in conflict with the purpose of my work, it has to change. Now the question is how soon it changes, how far it changes, who changes it, by when can it change? These are matters of method of detail. But once I set my, I see myself and I see, find my workplace objectives and method of work not in, in conflict with the purpose of my work, I start the change and the status quo changes. I will give you an example. When I ran the prison assignment and I entered the prison, what was the purpose of my assignment? 
It was never given to me that this is the purpose of your assignment. Yeah. You are posted as Inspector General Prisons. I was only given one line order. You are posted as Inspector General Prisons till further orders. That's all it said. It did not say for what purpose. I had to find my own purpose. And when I found my own purpose, naturally, instinctively, and what is the purpose of such an institution? Is curing people, treating people, rehabilitating people, and stopping the revolving door for people from prison and back to prison, prison back to prison, repeating the crime. So I found my purpose. My purpose was reform, rehabilitation, correction, right? So there was a constructive discontent with what I saw. And because it was constructive and it was discontent, it led to change. And because it was constructive, it started to look for well, what all can I do to address what I saw as an ailing institution. What was ailing? There was no time management inside the prison. Prisoners had no control over how they spent their day and night. They would keep awake at night and sleep through the day. There was no education. There were lack of libraries. There were no act creative activities. There was no self-help. There was also no skills development. Otherwise, how do you do? There was no education, of course. All these started to happen. There was no yoga. There was no prayer. There was no meet, uh, meditation programs. And therefore, all these start, when started to happen because of constructive discontent and meeting the purpose. And the purpose was not being met. So I asked myself, am I a guard or am I a guardian? I chose to be a guardian because there were already guards. Guards were out there on the rooftops. I'm not a constable guard. No. I'm a leader guardian. So a leader guardian is a provider. No. Leader guardian is a provider, a reformer, a transformer, a nurturer, a trainer, a mentor, or a champion. So once I started to do all that, that's all. So it's an approach with which you, uh, the mindset with which you approach your work makes a difference. Thank you very much, ma'am. You are enlightening myself. And uh, friendly speaking, when I read your book, I just feel like, are you not scared? When you first <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. what? I'm an officer. I'm <laughs> trained. I volunteered. If I'm an army officer, I'm trained. I volunteered. I've got the uniform and I've got a team. And I've got so many people and I've got the wherewithal. I've got my resources. I am no more man or a woman. I'm a soldier. Second question, ma'am. How you handle all your your team that is maybe most of them are men and you know men is very hard to to listen to women i can tell you men are respectful towards a woman they respect so how to gain the respect they are respectful to a woman they can trust and how do they trust the woman they know she they, she will stand by them when they need her thank you so much eliza Ma'am, you have held yourself with such dignity in spite of breaking a lot of norms. You talked about there is still a minority of men who are really very supportive towards women. Someone from across the border, all the way from Bangladesh, an engineering student from Bangladesh has a question for you. I would like to call him on the virtual podium. Toastmaster Mohammed Rifat Hussain. Hello, ma'am. Hello. As a patriot committed to the progress of our nation, I recognize the pivotal role of empowering women in this journey. What advice or suggestions would you offer to the next generation of Bangladesh on actively contributing to the women's empowerment? What can I do on an individual level to contribute in this journey? Consider their needs as alike as yours. How are their needs different from yours? To understand the other human being, put yourself in their place. Switch the role. Supposing you were the woman and your wife the man, what would have your, been your need? 
You don't need a textbook. You want to see somebody in pain? Go through the same simul simulation of that pain. You'll know how it's painful. I think switching roles, playing the roles, that's where you... So understand, she doesn't have to tell you. She doesn't have to tell you. Switch the role and say, okay, I'll play the role of a mother and you play the role of the father. Yeah. My expectation from you as a father. You will start writing down. You so naturally understand it. So rather than she telling you or yeah. the person telling you what is the expectation, you already are understanding it. So it's being sensitive, switching the roles. You want to know where the shoe pinches? Okay, wear the same shoe. Fantastic. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Rafat. Ma'am, I would like to take you on a little different road now, a little towards the spiritual side of you. I read somewhere that you're a Gemini and you describe the Geminis as people who kind of have split personalities, you mentioned that you, when you are at work, you're fully in it. You can be attached yet very detached and you have no feelings of remorse. As an unapologetic Sagittarius, I deeply connect with this particular sentiment of yours. A lot of times people do not understand the difference between being involved and being entangled in the job you're passionate about. Would you please elaborate a little more on the difference between being involved and being entangled and explain what it means to be attached yet very detached? Entangled in my mind is being, is being hitched to results. Being involved means continue to give and serve and let it progress and grow. Thank you so much, ma'am. And how do you manage to remain attached and still detached? How do you manage that? How do you condition your mind for that attitude? Selfless work. You become selfish with for results. You're selfless if you're not waiting for results, but benefiting others and not looking for what's in it for me. Because that's what I am for, is for others. So the more others get is joy to me. So it's not what's in it for me. It's one it is for others. That's what my work is for. The service That's selflessness. Condition. Rising above your own needs. That means sometimes putting yourself into discomfort for the comfort of others. The service leadership as we know it. Yeah. Servant leadership. Servant leadership. Ma'am, a quick uh, rapid fire for you. Three questions. Yeah. You can answer in yes or no. Yeah. Are you a workaholic? No. Are you a believer? Yes. Do you identify yourself as spiritual? Yes. Ma'am, you had once said that spirituality is mother of all professions. And our next question comes in regard wherein this particular Toastmaster needs a little guidance on that aspect. I would like to call on stage a market researcher by profession, Toastmaster Punita Singh. Hello, ma'am. Hi. We often focus on external grooming for building confidence, the etiquette, the soft skills, and whatnot. Do you think for a working woman, internal grooming is also important? So when I say internal grooming, I mean strengthening the spirituality part to build confidence. Has spirituality also played a role in your journey as well? Let me define spirituality to you before. My spirituality is not ritualistic. My spirituality is not religious. My spirituality is human conduct. It's humanity as a whole my behavior. I am more inclined towards Buddha's philosophy. Right action, right deed, right thought. It's more of action and the karma. I am, my uh, spirituality is not sitting and doing mantra, jap and prayer and then after that I do whatever I want. 
I would do what is needed to be done. And if I have the time, I'll sit the mantra job. But if I don't have the mantra job, my first mantra is the, doing the right thing for what I'm meant for. To me, this is spirituality. So once you put this as a defiance spirit, is human behavior, is being kind, is being empathetic, is being gracious, is being giving, is being discomfort for the comfort of others, is being selfless. To me, this is spirituality. Is spiritual. It's the working with through your spirit, and the spirit only makes you do the right thing. So spirit may pray or mantra or meditate is a different thing, but behavior is critical. So for me, being a good human being is being spiritual. Thank you so much, Punita. Thank you. Thank and you. that was a one part of your question. What was the second part of your question? Uh, I just meant that uh, for working women, is internal grooming important to build yes. confidence? Yes. I want to answer that. That was a good question. Now, for a working woman ignores two things. She ignores self-care and she no ignores internal software uh, care. These are because she doesn't give time to herself. She doesn't give self-ware and self-care. Self-ware is like software. So she does, which means that she doesn't give time to herself. And self-ware doesn't come with, without giving time to yourself, your inner coding. And self-care means physical exercise, mental well-being, nutrition, time to yourself. So I think most of the women are for all time others, but they ignore self-care, which is their own health sometimes. That I think is, uh, uh, is many women suffer from. They care for others all the time, but at the cost of their own health. They forget that as long as they're healthy, they're able to care for others. The day they're not, they will be dependent on others. And others may be there, maybe not there. So I would think it's the duty of every woman to groom herself for self-care and self-ware. And self-ware comes by reading, reflecting, listening to, uh, to, uh, to intellectually stimulating, inspiring stories or seminars or conferences where she gets inspired, seeing, experiencing. So self-ware and self-care for every woman should be the mantra of her grooming. And yoga, physical fitness, mental physical, spiritual fitness, social health. Social health is important. Her networking. She must have good, credible, reliable friends to return to. That's social health. So totality of health is spiritual health includes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, when we talk about spirituality, there is another aspect which, which kind of changes with time, and that is the concept of morality. Morality changes with society. What do you feel about the changing morality in society at the moment? Changing morality for women, the paradigm shift that is happening in the morals that were there, let's say, 50 years ago, as opposed to what morals are upheld today. I think if more we move towards, go back to Buddha's teachings, you'll not have a conflict. His his fundamentals, his teachings have, uh, I think are, could, if they are the beacons, you have no conflict. Right action, right deed, right thought, right behavior. I think all those fourfold path and the uh, the, uh, the path which the eight, eight, eight tenets and the fourfold path, I think there is no conflict in that. If you are flexible with it, then expediency comes. Now we can be, we can also be uh, practical by instance giving. Let's like say, for instance, a particular instance, I killed a person because I saw him killing another and I had to kill him. Now the question is, is that a murder or is that saving a life or a saving a situation? Then the law takes over. Now the law takes over to say, 
even if you did it for a right cause, you could not have taken law into your own hands. Now, is that the right or the wrong? Why did the law not protect him? Why? Because if you do not, law does not protect him, then there may be mayhem. There may be a lot more killings to say that was the right. That means taking law into your own hands will actually destroy the uh, the security fabric of society. But ethically, he may have been done right. Morally, he may have done right. Legally, he has not done. So therefore, you can always discuss a particular situation. Go by situational, you may have a better answer. Uh, Ma'am, there is this moral dilemma that most people face in corporate working space these days. Regarding that moral dilemma, here is a question from Yaska Deva Bayari Toastmaster, an IIT Kharagpur alumnus currently working as program manager in an edutech company. Yaska. Thank you, Gayatri. Hello, ma'am. I had met you almost seven years back in an event in Calcutta once, an <clears throat> ISKCON event of Teladuta. So I'm very happy to meet you here. So my question is, ma'am, when especially when, you know, in a positional manager, when we take some decision, we get often faced with opposition. So what happens is, uh, you know, I'm in a dilemma situation where should I do the what is the right thing or change my path from the ideal path to consider all the factors into account? Right. So, you know, and because what happens is when we try to do the right thing, people get offended to it. So should I bow down to those or, you know, should I, you know, take the right thing, even though it might feel that we are crossing their path. So that's my question. Give me an example, because it uh, generically cannot become a general answer. Just uh, I had to become specific in that kind of a question. What's your question? No, uh, give me an uh, example. Yes, ma'am. So basically, let's say in a work, right, we have to put down policies, right? So when you are putting down policies, like as simple as let's say we are tracking people's, you know, where are they going, especially I deal with the field team. So what happens is as an employer, I want to ensure that I want to track every people, right, as much as possible. But when it comes down to their, you know, there's another policy that comes into picture telling, no, no, we have to be a little more transparent with them, give them that free hand. So these are two conflicting things where one person says, no, we have to track every person to the right thing. Another person says, no, 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 it is not morally right. It's, it's the intrusion of personal space. We have to give them a free hand. We have to ensure that, you know, we have to give them that space, right? So I'm conflicted with these two ideologies. I'm not sure what to do. Whether should I please one set who says, no, 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 we have to ensure that everybody is tracked till the end that, you know, they feel choked. Or should we leave them to a personal space where there is a possibility that they may cheat, you know, giving that leniency into space. So these are the two conflicts that I'm putting into play. You talk your management. Yes. Management is an art. That's why, why management is not rocket science. You have to see, you have to feel, you have to listen, you can to understand and also took the, take the larger interest in mind. And you'll also have to be flexible. But there's no dilemma in this. It's a management policy you're talking about. And management policy is sometimes very situational. It's also linked to what kind of people are you dealing with. There are many variables. There are many variables. But the question here is with what intention are you dealing? Your intention is important. So this is all management about. Management is not a, a mathematics. Management is the art of dealing with human beings to ensure their productivity is at its best and the objectives are achieved for which you are made. So how do you deal with this? What works when? What works when? In which situation? What kind of people? In what environment? Things being done in COVID times and things being done pre-COVID times and post-COVID times would be very different. Wouldn't they be different? Things done yes. in peacetime yes. and things done in conflict times would be different. Things done with uh, uh, semi-literate people and things done with fully literate people. Things done with diversity would be different. Things done in different cultures would be different. But the question is, are you listening? What's your intention? What are people saying? What will work for it? 
what are the constraints and what are the resources? It's so many things mixed. That's management. Yeah. So you're talking about the art of management. And art of management is not two plus two four. It's not two plus two four. That's why you're looking for managers and that's why you're looking for leaders. Therefore, leadership and management is, is a very important art, skill. And those people who know how to manage people, find the situations, co-op people, benefit people, and keeping his own ego the last, his own benefit the last, but the larger good in place, make better leaders and better managers. But to explore that situation, you have to you have to listen and learn yourself, but you have to have the experience sometimes. You that's why more experienced the more you know the art of negotiation, conflict management. But these Thank are all you. arts. The more you read on management, the more skills you know. That, that means you are expanding your toolkit, of your toolkit, which tool to use when. Yeah. Your toolkit should have all of these tools available, when to use which tool. So that's management, which has a toolkit. So there's no one tool. You say, ma'am, this is the situation. I would say, use this tool. No. I'll say, no. Look at all your tools which you have. Listen to every situation. And then use which, it's like a surgeon, which which weapon, to, which um, uh, instrument to use so that the patient doesn't die. And that, like, I understand but the problem comes here is when people's emotions also come into picture. Like recently, you know, like especially in the case of, let's say we have to let go people, right? On one case, I have that emotion connected, but on other case, I have to look at the greater good of the company. So how do I put my heart in the right place in this situation? I like didn't get the first place. part of your question. Second part I got. Like, let's say, you know, when emotions come into picture of people, it becomes difficult to choose. I prefer, okay, let me please this person and keep on the cost of me being harmed. Maybe my finances going down or something like that. So that again becomes... That's where the reason has to prevail. That's where the reason has to prevail. Not emotions, but the reason, the intellect. Got it. Thank you so much. Back to you, guys. Thank you, Yaska. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, you just specifically spoke about the wartime leadership versus peacetime leadership. Like Churchill was a wartime leader, but did not really perform very well when he was in the peacetime as a leader. Uh, Ma'am, what is your personal style of leadership? Are you a wartime leader or a peacetime leader? I'm a situational leader. How do we become that? <laughs> by, uh, by keeping your, all your five senses intact and open. Watching, seeing, feeling, hearing, touching, field-oriented, reading, group discussions. All this happens. Only then can you reach. I've, I, I'm a very decisive person, but I do not take decisions without holistic inputs. Yeah. And the strongest skill of mine is, if possible, go to the scene. Go to the site of the problem. Listen to the listen to the person directly. Eyewitness accounts, or see the problem as it is. Then only you get the best solution. Uh, my Pondicherry tenure as Lieutenant Governor was just full of solutions, only because I was on a regular weekly round. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, I used to take field rounds to go to see see the problem. So rather than problem coming to me. I used to go to the problem to see and feel it and sense it, and hear it and smell it. See people who and listen to them. Listen to them. And when once you start listening to the people who are right there or where the problem is, you start knowing where the disease is and you know the remedy. And you know the medicine to use. Rather than just do a prescription. No, I want to go to the patient. I want to see and feel the pulse, the blood pressure and the other tests, and then I'll prescribe. I may not prescribe you any medicine because you may just need some rest. Rather than saving you a crossing, no, I want to see the patient. I want to see these parents. So I'm more on going to the patient or the problem rather, but with experience, sometimes you can't go to the patient because it's far away. Then you bring people around who understand it. 
listen to everybody and then take a decision. You can go wrong, but at least you made the effort to go right. Ma'am, the situational leadership is something that we get to learn here in Toastmasters. Toastmasters as a community has supported several people, not just with overcoming fear of public speaking, but also in developing their leadership skills. The tagline of Toastmasters is where leaders are made. As we celebrate 100 years of Toastmasters this year, it is interesting to note that the women started getting Toastmasters membership in 1973. And today, 70% of the total Toastmasters are women at this point of time. Wow. Do you think that a platform like Toastmasters International can help yeah. women express themselves more powerfully and more precisely and develop that situational leadership skill in within themselves? One, why not? I think you're playing a, a remarkable uh, contribution to uh, creating uh, female leadership. And remember, a, a woman leader is very inclusive by nature. Once a woman leader comes, she's not going to be partial to anybody. She will be very humane. That's her nature. So therefore, creating more female leadership means good for all. Good for all. Because she is a mother at heart. And mothers are always very inclusive. That's the biological inherent DNA quality we are born with. She has only to continue to fine-tune it, grow with it, and nurture it so that this inherent strength of ours doesn't get weakened. Ma'am, we have asked you a lot of questions and we continue seeking your guidance. But we also want to take this opportunity to extend a gratitude to you on behalf of all the women across all professions. You may have been an IPS officer, but you have touched upon lives of women working in several other professions. And we would like to tell you how. I would like to welcome on stage HR professional. She is talent acquisition HR lead from a private bank. I would like to welcome on stage Toastmaster Donna Sen. Thank you, Gayatri. I quote, The moment you design the post of an HR manager in the police, your whole outlook towards your team changes. You designate an official to look after their health, their professional needs, their preparedness and motivation, which in most cases becomes quintessential. While preparing for a training program in my current organization, I happened to come across this quote of yours. And ma'am, as an HR professional, I feel that you just simplified and gave a clear direction to the entire diaspora of human resources for any organization. The kind of reforms that you brought into Tihar are motivational to say the least, because even hardened inmates were responding to the norms of a structured organization. This kind of service to humanity beyond duty is unparalleled. What this teaches me is that we must think beyond simple execution of our daily duties. The success of an institution depends on the physical and mental well-being of all the stakeholders associated with that institution. Thank you, Dr. Kiran Bedi, for setting an exemplary standard in every role you've undertaken. Your dedication serves as an inspiration to professionals in various fields, motivating them to strive for excellence in their own endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. So kind of you and so generous of you. Thank you, ma'am. How does it feel to have impacted so many lives? Today, you met people from really different parts of not just India, but even from world. There are many others who have, who have a lot of questions for you. How does it feel to have impacted so many lives? I don't know that. I don't know that. I keep hearing 
but I don't know this. I hear and I move on. It doesn't stay with me. I'm on to the next day now. That's it. My next day, my next event, my next, next task, my next reading, my next appointment, my next walk, next treadmill, like that. I don't, I just don't know. I just move on. I don't stay back. Gayatri, nothing impacts me. It just moves on. I am interestingly moving from one brilliant move, uh, event from the other. Very inspiring for me. But I get inspired myself. It's an inspiration for me to say, do better, <laughs> do more. Ma'am, you can. Yeah. Believe me, everybody who has been a part of putting this particular meet meeting together, this event together with you, they are going to tell their grandchildren that we had an opportunity to interact with Dr. Kiran Bedi, and we are not kidding. Ma'am, in another one minute's time, we would like to have a team photograph with you, with all the people who actually put in efforts for putting this meeting together. I request our tech master and sergeant at arms to start spotlighting all the wonderful men and women both, because ma'am, you are not gender specific. The first advice I got from one of senior Toastmasters, Satyadeep Basu, was this. Don't make it female oriented because Kiran Bedi does no. not only belong to women. <laughs> and I think that says a lot of it. That's wonderful. I'm so grateful that you felt this way. Yes, I belong to all of you. I don't belong to one or the other. Because I'm a very wholesome person who doesn't work in parts. <laughs> that is Satari Basu who warned me not to make it very feminist. Yeah, ma'am, because you are an ideal to Indians, not to the women community only. To the Indians, in particular, and the world as a whole, to be precise, ma'am. Thank you for I, blessing I must, this occasion. I must tell you, Satyadeep, all my, uh, whatever I've achieved is by my male teams. <laughs> it's no, a man who's put by me, the, my youngsters, my... Team member, oh my God, what a powerful male teams I've had who've done maximum work and given their heart and soul to me. I cannot thank them enough. They've been so loyal to me. They stood by me. I'm so grateful. Therefore, I'm, I've not worked with women, by the way. I've worked with men more. Yeah, ma'am. And we have heard in so many places as well as in movies that it's not, there's no gender bias. We should treat ourselves as Indians, not male and female. As Absolutely. great human beings, as persons. Absolutely. No, a stage has come and we now emerged as persons who are getting the best of the traits of men and women. Man and a woman, both are have their unique qualities nature gives you. And develop as a person, get the stretch of the andro and the gynae and become andro androgynous managers. Correct, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for gracing this occasion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Satyadi. Over to you. Over to you, Gayatri. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would now like to introduce you to all the women who participated with this particular event and helped us request the tech master. And request the tech master to please add all the, we have this one, this thing from, as a, we have only one man over here in this particular picture. <laughs> but his name is Krish and I call him my vitamin K because that is what he provides to everyone who needs his support, vitamin K. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this. And with that, I would like to hand over the virtual podium to our master of ceremonies, Toastmaster Jayati Tata. Thank you, Toastmaster Gatri Deshmukh. Oh, wow. What learning. Mm -hmm. What immense takeaways I have from you, Dr. Kiran mm -hmm. Bedi. Mm -hmm. Beautiful words, wonderful sentences, and a lot of things on which I could ponder on. Some of the points I take away from this particular 
meeting with you are, if I will. The secret of success is to do the common thing uncommonly well. Mm -hmm. Opportunities don't happen. You create them. Hard work is the elixir to success. Right action, right deed, right thought. Don't try to change your name. Deal with them. <laughs> Thank you, man, so much. And I am totally privileged to have shared this screen space with you. I now call upon Toastmaster Abha Ori, District 124 Club Growth Director and Vice President of a chain of free schools. Abha. Good evening, Dr. Bedi. Evening. It is such a such an honor to be here and to listen to you speak. But I must confess, every time I hear your name, I'm taken back to the 80s. When I used to visit Delhi, where my grandparents stayed, every summer, but in the 80s, suddenly something seemed to have changed. And everybody would speak about Crane Bedi. <laughs> and I was so... Um, you know, I, I wanted to know what it was all about. And I remember every single person, I think, on the streets of Delhi was talking about how you would just tow away cars. And me at that time would was so petrified of you, you know, because I used to think you're some kind of a, 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 a very scary persona there until I later on realized what you were actually doing. And today hearing you speak, you make it seem so simple. You have simplified things so nicely, you know. It's such a huge learning for, I'm sure, for everybody, as Jayati also mentioned. And the way you have broken down your leadership, your management skills, I think that is something all of us are going to learn by. So thank you so much, Dr. Bedi, for coming here today, enlightening me. You were always the crane Bedi, and I'm sure... After today, you're going to still remain my crane baby for me because you just know how to yeah. set things right and so easily. Thank you so much for coming. So grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. I now hand over the virtual podium to our Associate Program Quality Director, Toastmaster Krish Naik, an educator by profession, for the closing address. Krish. Thank you very much, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow Toastmasters, as we come to the close of this remarkably ceremony, I am filled with profound sense of gratitude and inspiration. Today, we have had the distinct privilege, like so many of us have already spoken before me, of hosting a true icon and a pathbreaker, trailblazer. I'm running short of, uh, I didn't... Uh, you know, update my thesaurus, but a lot of other words, in uh, especially in the in the in the realm of public service and leadership. The I will use the in front of your name, the Dr. Kiran Bedi. Thank you very much, and uh, her life and career stand as a testament to the power of determination and an unwavering commitment to making a positive impact on society. So, I don't have to take a leap of faith or take permission to proudly say that. She is the epitome of all those values that we Toastmasters uphold. Integrity, respect, service, and excellence. And as we reflect on the words of wisdom shared by Dr. Kiran Bedi tonight, let us not merely see them as insightful anecdotes or uh, hey, it was nice to hear about it, but look at them and reflect on them as beacons that will guide us towards, uh, towards tomorrow where Passion and purpose, they have to meet, they have to converge. In a world often, uh, you know, where we face so many challenges, Dr. Bedi's exemplary life teaches us that adversity can be the catalyst for positive change. If you have a team, when you can rely on that team and have a positive attitude to take you through that. So I extend my deepest gratitude to you, Dr. Kiran Bedi, for gracing us with your presence sharing your invaluable insights and inspiring 
every one of us here to aspire for greatness. We all are going about our normal lives, but listening to you, I think all of us will aspire for greatness. And I, I really hope that your legacy continues to ignite the, the flame of uh, being of service, uh, being uh, uh, duty bound and, you know, bring out that leader in each of us. So Dr. Bedeep, blue sky is away to you for you are a falcon. It is your nature to fly and fly you will, Dr. Kiran Bedi. Thank you. And with that, I would like to call on screen my peer associate program quality director, Toastmaster Vandita. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naik. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krishnesh. Thank you, ma'am. As the presiding officer today and being the vice president education for Connected Across Miles to Smarts Club, it is my utmost pleasure to have an audience of more than 200 attendees at such hour in Indian time, that is 10, 21 p.m. I am extremely grateful to ma'am, Dr. Kiran Bedi for being here and inspiring us. So fellow Toastmasters and distinguished guests, as we conclude this extraordinary meeting on the eve of Women's Day, in the presence of the incredible Dr. Kiran Bedi, let's reflect on the inspiration and wisdom she has shared. Dr. Bedi's remarkable journey exemplifies resilience, leadership, and a commitment to service. Tonight, we have witnessed the power of effective communication and the impact it can have on shaping our lives. Let our words ignite a fire within us to strive for excellence, embrace challenges, and lead with purpose. As we leave this gathering, Let's carry the spirit of learning, growth, and empowerment. Thank you, Dr. Kiran Bedi, for gracing us with your presence and enriching our lives with your valuable insights. Teamwork is of utmost importance in the success of any endeavor. We owe a word of thanks to those who helped us in making today's meeting a success. On behalf of Connected Across Miles Toastmasters Masters Club, I extend my gratitude to Toastmaster Satyadeep Basu for all the guidance he provided us behind the scenes, away from the limelight. I'm also grateful to our club growth director, Ava Odi DTM, for gracing this occasion. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Division A Director Vivek Jora, Toastmaster Eliza Rosha, and Toastmaster Sharmishtha Ghosh for helping make this meeting a success. I would also like to thank Mehek Agarwal for her contribu contribution towards the PR that was done incredibly well. Toastmasters, let's continue to speak, lead, and inspire. With that, I would like to hand over the stage to Dr. Gayatri Deshmukh. With this, thank you. thank you, Vandita. Thank you. With this, we formally adjourn the meeting. And Dr. Kiran Bedi, ma'am, thank you so much. Since I was a child, I have tried to just dare. And every time I dared, people said to me, Do you understand what you have to do with Kiran Bedi? Yes. I used to say yes. I used to say yes. And I think many others like me said yes. Yeah. And I'm happy that today I'm sitting here with you. My mom is proud of me today because you were her childhood hero. You were my childhood hero and childhood hero for many others here. Thank you so much, ma'am. Regards to your mother too. Mommy, please, my regards to your mom. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all very much for a wonderful session. I know you're the brightest to the bright in the society, men and women, strong professionals in leadership, social leadership, professional leadership. Wonderful. And I know this is a very valuable forum. I want to thank you for making me part of this valuable forum. And you made us really, really, really indebted to you throughout. We are looking forward to your journey. We keep watching you. We keep learning from you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good luck. All the best for the year ahead. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you.